The next story is a lighter one, and it's it's an entertaining one. It's about the Liberal Democrats. Um, so they have re- released a report on the 2019 general election, which, to refresh your memory, started like this. I never thought that I would stand here and say that I'm a candidate to be Prime Minister. But when I look at Boris Johnson and Jeremy Corbyn, I am absolutely certain I could do a better job than either of them. And that general election campaign ended like this. The SNP, as you can see there, have taken East Dunbartonshire. Joe Swinson will no longer be an MP. Well, so many questions being asked, even during the campaign, about the nature of the Lib Dem campaign. So, yes, the the Lib Dems entered the 2019 general election pitching Joe Swinson as the next prime minister. um, And they ended up going down to 11 seats with Joe Swinson herself losing her seat. Um, As it stands, the Lib Dems still don't have a replacement leader. I think Ed Davies is is currently the interim. Um, So as I introduced at the beginning, the Lib Dems have done a report on the failure in that general election. It's supposed to be asking hard questions. Um, so that the party can rebuild. Um, Let's go to some findings. So some findings from this report on Joe Swinson. Your candidate for prime minister had gone down well at conference to members and as an ambitious reflection of polling from earlier in the year, it appealed unrealistic to the wider public, especially given that we were already falling in the polls. Now let's go to the Lib Dems on Brexit. Um, So this is in the election review. We alienated large chunks of the population on Brexit. The electorate was divided into three groups, uh, 20 to 25% passionate Remainers, 20 to 25% passionate Leavers, and 50 to 60% who weren't really that passionate either way. As a Liberal Party, we could never have gained votes from the 20 to 25% pro-Leave group, but we did effectively ignore the biggest group. Um, And then finally, on the, the leadership team, this is again from the report, the word hubris was often used to describe the campaign attitude. While it was clearly unintentional, there was a definite sense of believing our own hype. Um, And then they quoted uh, a member who they'd interviewed for the report, that small group drunk the Kool-Aid and believed she could do it. They're saying they genuinely believed that Joe Swinson could be prime minister. And finally, before I go to you, Ashton Aaron, potentially the most interesting part of this report is not what was contained in it, um, but how it was briefed. And this report was was briefed in a very explicit way to the Times, who led with this on the weekend. Lib Dems blame cult of Chaka Umana for poll <laughs> defeat. Um, so really hanging him out to dry there. Uh, I'll start with Ash. What do you make of this report? Do you think they've been too harsh to Chaka? I mean, they're, they're being very harsh to everyone, in fact. I mean, it was a pretty catastrophic general election campaign. I mean, it was like the Report Drag Race reading challenge where you just can't take your eyes away. It just gets more brutal and brutal as the read goes on. Um, I do think that Chaka Roman is being hung out to dry bit, and I'm not a fan of how he's carried on in terms of his political strategy. I'm not a fan of his politics either. But I think in some ways it's a little bit of a case of blame a newcomer into the party and saying, you've got this all wrong and this is your fault. Whereas actually it was much more um, about Jo Swinson for, for me. I think it was just, it was her um, inability to take yes for an answer when it came to parliament. You had the Labour Party being dragged incrementally further and further towards that pro-Remain position that she wanted but she couldn't turn around and say yes I'm going to work with you in order to you know frustrate a Brexit deal going through parliament and forcing it to a second referendum uh, by having some kind of minority government she didn't take that opportunity when it was offered to her Um, and yes that was in part because of absorbing all of these sort of you know ex-Labour defectors who held a real deep antipathy right loathing of jeremy corbyn because he was sort of the great usurper of their labor party careers it meant that she boxed herself off but i think in addition to that there was a genuine disdain for the politics of populism um you know joe swinson in her bones is a technocrat she was actually much more hawkish on austerity than any conservative was by you know the time of 2019 and she I think saw herself as a kind of centrist savior of 
of politics, you know, mm. with that, you know, adopting of the spider badge and, you know, the kind of you know, girly SWAT T-shirt. And you kind of imagine her, you know, if she was around 2020 politics, she'd be like, this Karen is the manager. Like, it's that kind of like you know completely hollow uh liberal technocratic feminism which has no basis in either the politics of people's everyday lives or the insurgent politics which have dominated the political system of the past few years um so i think that the emphasis on sugar Amuna, look i love taking the piss out of him as much as anybody else you know he stopped being a garage dj and moved into soulful house when the MCs came in, and that tells you all you need to know about him. But I think that the more fundamental problem was Joe Swinson, how she saw herself, how she conceived of politics, um, and her inability to take yes for an answer when a second referendum uh, was a possibility through parliamentary mechanisms. Well, I, th- I think the implication of the briefing is that Chaka Omana was was partly responsible for um the the hubris of of joe swinson so you do i, I remember the, the 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 period where uh chuck Arumina sort of had on his twitter the shadow foreign secretary and ed, ed davey announced himself as shadow chancellor and i suppose joe swinson must have called herself leader of the opposition but they they had this idea that they were a government in in waiting and i think the the suggestion is that that partly came from those labor defectors and um, i think that Aaron, might be true i think that might be true but i think Really, when you when you see, uh, you know, some of Joe Swinson's positioning even before that point, I don't think it's all chukka. Is what I'm saying. Aaron, I mean, what's I mean? She lost her seat, and these people are a humiliation to themselves. But the, the most tragic thing of all is they shaped uh, the outcome of the 2019 general election, arguably more than anybody else. Um, Labour got 32, percent which is obviously wasn't great. Uh, but when you consider there was a split at the beginning of the year, if you, you know, normally if a party, a party splits, normally that's quite a big deal. You can look at 1981 to three with the formation of the SDP. Labour then proceeds to get, I think, 28%. Uh, it, it's often very bad news for a political party. So you had that split by people like Chuck Roman and Chris Leslie and so on. And then you had later on in the year those same people with Joe Swinson saying that they wouldn't work with Labour to have an interim sort of coalition government of some kind. And so the handmaids, the kind of the people that gave birth this political moment of Boris Johnson being in charge, a moment of supreme national crisis, you know, these people will take significant responsibility despite how useless they are. Uh, and I think Ash is right, you know, it's a shame we don't have some kind of uh, Joe Swinson 2020 Twitter account where she's kind of still carrying, you know, the, the, we had the Miliband one, if he'd won and what was going on during a Miliband premiership, maybe we should be doing that with, with Joe Swinson. I mean, it was like, it was like a, uh, it was like a sort of FBP troll account became sentient. It was incredible. It was absolutely incredible. The debate her, this kind of deranged stuff and people were like, what are, you, what are you talking about? And it became like this thing. And what was really revealing was a significant part of the lobby were like, yeah, this is what people are really talking about right now. And yeah, it, because and, you know, it's, all, it's all people who are prefects at school. It chimes with them on a deeply resonant level. They see this overgrown head girl, you know, coming onto the political arena, demanding to speak to somebody who's in charge and go, yeah, this is a real we, grown up. But, but the saddest thing for me is that, you know, a lot of Labour people got in bed with that. That's the saddest thing of all for me. I know people that were like Corbyn supporters who voted Lib Dem, not in the European elections, in the local elections to give Labour a, a bloody nose. And I'm thinking, you've got councillors who could do amazing stuff. So you might have a socialist person, a socialist running to be a councillor where you are. Why would you vote for the Liberal Democrats? And I think too many people, and that to me speaks about an absence of long-term political education on the, on the British left. Um, that's bigger than Jeremy Corbyn, that's bigger than Navarra Media, that goes back decades. And just don't be seduced by this nonsense. And then we had the whole thing about the, the Europe. And look, we can talk about the Labour position, I think ultimately by 2020, they were, 2019, they were in a, a bad place regardless. But the European elections never, ever mattered. They never mattered. You have a 35% turnout. Nobody's ever taken these elections seriously. And by the way, we know that because the Tories got what? 9%. Right, right now in some in some polls they're polling fifty percent. European elections do not matter, and yet again a significant part of our sort of uh, 
of the lobby of the sort of the people that are opinion makers around political journalism in this country to get eminently seriously and so the failure the catastrophe the calamity of joe swinson and chuck Arumina, yes it's it's derisable it's laughable but it also reflects on a really important point which is that 10 years ago the centrists, the moderates, the status quo fetishists had three political parties. Uh, and by December 2019, they only had one. And that was the Liberal Democrats. And they did terribly. So what does that say to you about the sort of the, the desire and the taste for change in this country? And by the way, it's not all entirely positive and progressive. Quite a lot. And I, I still think for much of the for much of the commentary, that's not really cu cut through that actually you don't really have a control over any of the major parties anymore uh, and you don't really have any ideas to offer the electorate more generally uh, and, it, and it's something which still there hasn't been a, a reckoning with i think i mean i think i think there are two things which really need engaging with and one is that the lib dems are completely ideologically bereft right you don't have that kind of tradition of you know Charles Kennedy, Orange Book, Lib Dems, who had something which they truly believed in, right? They had an ideological foundation. By 2019, it was uh, David Cameron come again, right? They, and nobody wanted that. No, Nobody wanted that style of politics. It was David Cameron without the charisma, um, which, which really wasn't much of an offer at all. But there is, I think, a huge challenge for Labour, which... I think is related to the way in which uh, the Lib Dems are able to scupper Labour's chances and a few marginal seats. And it's because Labour has changed in a big way and uh, occupies a very ambivalent place towards its own history. Uh, something which was sort of partially resolved by Labour in 2017 and then came a cropper in 2019, which is, is Labour a party of civic-minded progressives or is it a party of workers struggle now neither of those are easy answers and i know that there are many on the left who would go party of workers struggle that's that i can just define it into existence and mm. job done whereas mm. actually a sense of you know what is a collective identity for workers and after 40 years of neoliberalism after mm. the demise of trade union uh organization and membership after the gutting of working class residential Set, you know centers through gentrification in metropolitan areas but then also just the impoverishment and immiseration of lots of former industrial towns that so that's not an easy answer and uh, you know were you to go ah civic-minded progressives you know professionals um well good luck with that under a first past the post electoral system um you know you you also won't even fashion a, a social majority necessarily out of that so two very very difficult things there and also i think an ongoing struggle for the lib dems but i think that you know i made a lot of errors of judgment in 2019 in terms of where i thought things were going and what i thought i had to base my judgments on and so now rather than confidently setting out what the answers are to it i'm trying to think about okay so what are the really pressing questions and then other people can answer them like mm -hmm. you well, well what's really interesting is that report you know it says actually what people were saying in in labor like 50 percent of the country don't really care about this all the noise is coming and it, look 25 percent is still, it's still a lot of people they can make a lot of noise they can attract a lot of funding they can have protests with a million people right then that's true there were huge pro-eu second referendum protests uh, and, the, and the problem for Labour was they didn't cat and, it, and if they had done that successfully, they would have won the election. They didn't get that 50% energised. And I, I don't think that was actually necessary just about Brexit. I think, I think it's very hard to do that when so much of your own party constantly denigrates you for four years. It would happen to Keir Starmer. If Keir Starmer had two thirds of his parliamentary party saying he's an arsehole seven days a week, that the exact same thing would happen. And so, I, you know, yes, it dovetails with Brexit and the EU stuff, but it's not the entire story. Thank you.